Is the stage set for Ripple to absolutely dominate the stablecoin market? We're going to be talking about it. Welcome to the channel, everyone. My name is Nick. For those that are new to the channel, I'm hoping that you guys stick around and subscribe to join us along the journey. As we look at this announcement on June 11th, we can see that the overall acquisition with Standard Custody is now completed. We have earlier this year, Ripple announced its intent to acquire Standard Custody. And today, we're pleased to share that the acquisition is now complete. And uh, if we actually look at this, right? One, it's not just an acquisition. We also have Jack McDonald, who was the CEO at PolySign and Standard Custody. He is now joining Ripple as the new SVP of stablecoins. Very excited to share that as part of the deal close, I am joining Ripple as the SVP of stablecoins to lead the team bringing Ripple stablecoin to market later this year, though remaining CEO of Standard Custody as well. And again, as we really look at this, right, I've talked about stable coins. I've talked about the overall idea of Mika coming in and wiping out a few stable coins. I'm not going to mention any names, right? It will essentially lead us down the path to Ripple becoming the dominant and ultimately the only big player around stable coins. I feel like they cornered this market by becoming extremely compliant and working with regulators and making sure that they have everything set up to really kind of target this market. And we have paving a compliant path forward. Ripple closes standard custody acquisition and appoints Jack McDonald as senior vice president of stablecoins. Now, within this announcement, we, ha we have a few things. So number one, we have the breakdown of, you know, how earlier this year they had this intent to acquire standard custody and trust an enterprise grade regulated custodian for digital assets. Now it is fully complete and we have this is an exciting new chapter for Ripple to strengthen its existing product offerings and explore new complementary products like stablecoins underpinned by a commitment to regulatory compliance. Ripple's track record of working with global regulators and policymakers is underscored by the belief that in order for blockchain to become integral to the global financial infrastructure, the industry needs to build alongside regulatory and compliance regimes rather than around them. Now, also down here, right? The closing of this acquisition as a limited purpose trust company regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services to its license portfolio, which includes nearly 40 money transmitter licenses throughout the US, as well as the major payment institution license from the Monetary Authority of Singapore and a virtual asset service provider uh, registration with the Central Bank of Ireland. This enables the company to further strengthen its enterprise infrastructure solutions powered by blockchain and digital asset technology, allowing for better institutional customer service to tokenize, store, move, and exchange value. Again, all a part of the same path that they have been on since day one around the, around the internet of value. Um, and we have this deal closure follows close on the heels of Ripple announcing its plans to launch a US dollar backed stablecoin, a natural step for Ripple to continue bridging the gap between blockchain and traditional finance. There is a huge demand for stablecoins that deliver trust, stability and utility and Ripple will leverage its decade plus of experience building real world financial solutions for global institutions to address this growing market. Ripple will use both the stablecoin and XRP. Again, this is what I have been saying. A lot of people around the space, like I don't understand where these narratives start, but the idea around it was, is Ripple replacing XRP? And I even made a short video about it um, because that's what we've been hearing. And it's like, no, XRP and the stablecoin will both be utilized within its payment solution, which is a huge deal. I want you all to succeed this alt season. So I put together a full list of tools that you guys can utilize to track where the largest whales are putting their money in this space that could ultimately net you a ton of ROI. I'm also giving out 30 free crypto gems that are fully researched and even broken down into specific risk categories. Both of these guides are completely free. All you have to do is claim your access right now by utilizing one of the links down in the description below. What are you guys waiting for? Make sure that you guys have access to this, especially for this alt season that is nearing.
To continue serving enterprise customers around the world, Ripple stablecoin will be issued on the XRP Ledger to help bring more liquidity to the XRP Ledger's native DEX and to support more financial use cases on the Ledger for developers, users, and businesses alike. And uh, to that end, again, they did announce Jack McDonald as uh, the Senior Vice President of Stablecoins. With over three decades of experience working with investment banks, asset managers, financial services, and more recently, fintechs and digital assets, Jack brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to help lead the Stablecoin team and bring Ripple Stablecoin to market. So again, very exciting stuff. Again, as we look at you know this announcement down here, they also mention Medico. Both moves underscore the growing breadth uh, and importance of digital assets from stablecoins and CBDCs to tokenized real world assets like stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, and more. Market participants require trust, utility, and liquidity in order to unlock access to these new asset classes and the broader token economy. And Ripple is committed to accelerating that growth. So right there you have it, right? This is all a part of that same journey. And Medico and Standard Custody are two of the major acquisitions that Ripple did announce that are allowing them to forge this path to realizing in this token economy, but also the internet of value. And we have Ripple will continue to leverage its strong financial position to make smart acquisitions and to further cement the company's leadership in the enterprise blockchain space from cross-border payments to digital asset custody and beyond having the right licenses in place to better serve customers and adhere to regulatory compliance is a critical next step in paving the way for institutional adoption of blockchain technology. So very exciting stuff, very awesome stuff as well. Um, beyond that, we also have over here from Anderson, Today, Ripple announced that their acquisition of Center Custody is now finalized. Importantly, it also brings a certain license, and that's that NYDFS license permitting the company to offer custodial and escrow services for uh, clients, and that is a big one. I don't think people realize how big that is. Now, also, another critical piece of infrastructure in place for Ripple's institutional clients, it will be fundamental to Ripple stablecoin businesses where customers will be able to hold stablecoins securely along with crypto assets. Don't forget who are on the board of Standard Custody, big move. And for an example, here we have Tim Keeney, Vice Chairman, retired Vice Chairman of BNY Mellon, Head of Asset Processing and Global Markets, led organization of 25,000 people responsible for custodian, 25% of global institutional assets. Yeah, this is why these acquisitions are so significant. Now, beyond this, like I said, what name is Ripple gunning for? Well, I made a video talking about this, actually, and I still believe it, right? Like, regardless of if you support them or not, Tether, right? Tether is now concerned by the EU's problematic Mika stablecoin requirements. Now, I actually, and I know this is going to be crazy to say, I'm actually in agreement with them. I do think that uh, the stablecoin requirements is definitely problematic because, and I've talked about it, right? 60%. Having to hold 60% of bank cash in reserves puts the entire industry at risk with how weak banks are. We all know how weak banks are. Um, I do really want to put a spotlight on the fact that, like, although, yeah, Mika has great things tied into it, there's hidden pathways that these banks are, you know, really kind of seeping into the space through. And these pathways are forged through these regulatory regimes, like, for example, Mika. And I do think that it's a negative thing, regardless of if you support Tether or not. And I'm not saying that I support them. I'm just saying I agree with them on this because I don't think that any issuer of a stablecoin should have to hold 60% of bank cash. That's just ridiculous to me. Well, let me know what you guys think about that. But regardless, I do think that Ripple is uh, going to eat up Tether's lunch because as we look at Ripple, I mean, they are so prepared for this. The amount of tools in their arsenal to really kind of lead us down the path to becoming one of the most dominant players around stablecoins, it's so key. But also, what I find interesting about all of these moves being made by Ripple, maybe I'm the only one, it seems like Ripple is setting the stage for them to become a bank as well. Maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like they want to become a bank. But beyond that, institutional DeFi, right? Like all of these are significant pieces of the puzzle. And I've talked about this in the past. This goes back to uh, March when uh, this post got posted by vet underscore X zero. We have institutional DeFi on the XRP ledger and the compliance burden on those institutions can be solved with the AMM plus DID. With a recent blog post, ZKP zero knowledge proof is an important piece to enable those users as well. Exposing only minimum information on a public chain seems like a great middle path for those users between public and private. 
What I do miss is a stablecoin issuer that can handle large redemptions for the size of those institutions and maybe the Axelor network integration in May will be helpful to that. And um, pretty much everything that you see on this board here, Ripple has now under their belt with, of course, the XRP ledger. So if we're thinking about institutional DeFi, I think that's why we are starting to now witness a very big shift on Ripple side to target institutional DeFi initiatives and services. Now, also, we have here David Schwartz on a real blocker to institutional adoption of DeFi. Big shout out to XRP Drops. Sanctions compliance. The United States government has a list of entities that you are not allowed to do business with. And if you do, the punishment can be extremely high. Solutions like identity and sort of creating a sort of island inside the ocean where there's compliance will help to bring institutions into the DeFi world. And uh, check this out that there are we are seeing specific blockers to institutional adoption like one of the ones that's the simplest and easiest to talk about is sanctions compliance so uh, you uh, your listeners may not know that like the united states government has a list of entities that you are not allowed to do business with and if you do the sanctions can be the punishment can be extremely high and and I didn't know I was doing business with them is not an excuse. It's what's called strict liability. It means if you did it, you, you have to figure out a way not to do it, or you can't do the thing that might create the, the chance that you'll do it. And this is a real blocker to institutional adoption of DeFi. It's just one example, but it's, a, it's, 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 it's for, for many companies, it's like, if, if we can't do sanctions compliance, we can't do it. It's just a hard no, um, because they're facing potentially tens of millions of dollars you know, plus in liability. And there's nothing they can do about it. They're, they're just not going to do it. And so those are problems that are that are very tangible today. And so solutions like identity and sort of creating um, creating a sort of island inside the ocean where where there's compliance. These sort of steps towards compliance will help to bring institutions into the DeFi world. And I think I hope we can do that without trying to change. You, you know, like and it, Bank of America is not going to use Sushi Swap. You know what I mean? Like you know, it's like it's, it's just not going to happen. And Sushi Swap is not going to like require people to prove absence of sanctions compliance to, in order to use it because there's just no there's no practical way for them to do that. And so the thing is, if if what is the solution that doesn't try to that doesn't that doesn't try to impose one regulatory regime on an entire blockchain? Like Ethereum is not in the in the EU ecosystem. The XRPL is not under U.S. government jurisdiction. So the challenge is, if we're going to have public blockchains that aren't in jurisdictions, how can we allow enterprises to comply with regulations if they want to, which they do because they won't adopt the technologies if they can. And that's actually where the DID um, amendment comes in clutch. That's why when we go back over here, like AMM, DID, ZKP, stablecoins. Uh, the DID is a decentralized um, ID or digital ID. I forgot what it actually means if it's uh, digital or um, decentralized. I'm pretty sure it's digital. But regardless, it's a function on the network that allows for um, the sanctions compliance to actually be completed. It, it's allowing um, these entities to have uh, their identity issued out and pretty much tapped in on something like the XRP ledger. So I think that that's a crucial piece for this, especially around institutional DeFi. Um, it's definitely going to forge the path towards that. And I think that that's why we are now starting to see Ripple really heavily talking about um, institutional DeFi and targeting institutional DeFi because pretty much everything now that we are looking at when it comes to um, the XRP ledger, especially around institutional DeFi, all the tools are there now. All, it, all we really need is to bring institutions in to build, utilize, and ultimately adopt the XRP ledger, which I think is very exciting because now as we do start to see these big moves being made by Ripple, I think that they're forging a path to institutions to bring them into the XRP ledger through tokenization initiatives or you know DeFi initiatives, you name it. So very exciting stuff. Now, outside of that, one last one around Mika, we have how DeFi is regulated by Mika. Mika actually excludes generally DeFi products, but ESMA put out some uh, consultation and some guidance to try to consult also the market. Where is the boundary there? Reminder, Ripple has sent an eight page report to the ESMA to provide assistance. The chair of the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA, um, is shaping the future of crypto through Mika. Check it out. Not a centralized product. It's a decentralized product. You don't know who necessarily the owner is. It's launched by an anonymous person. How can they operate within a regulatory framework or can they not? So Mika actually um, excludes genuinely decentralized finance products. The question is, 
you know, what does that actually mean? And we actually put out some consultation and some guidance to try to consult also the market. Where is the boundary there? Because um, one person's DeFi is another person's actually, no, it's not DeFi. There is someone behind it and you can actually point to some responsibilities. So it's a very uh, difficult judgment call, but it's something that indeed we also will continue to monitor that boundary of what is within the Mika legal framework and what is not. They're not a centralized product. There you guys have it. And again, you know, as we really look at DeFi, it's going to be a challenging area to regulate. I don't think that they're going to regulate it fully. I think what they're going to do is you're going to have things like the XRP ledger, for an example, right? That have these specific amendments or features on it uh, that could be utilized if need be. For example, users on the XRP ledger are not going to have to comply to DID. But if an enterprise or an institution is going to be utilizing the XRP ledger, they will have to comply with DID. It's kind of similar to uh, Stellar, actually. And I brought this up on multiple occasions. On Stellar, on the network, um, the reason why Franklin Templeton chose Stellar to tokenize their money market fund was because Stellar provided the clawback amendment. They had the clawback amendment and they had all of the things that Franklin Templeton really needed. But the clawback was crucial because as a major institution or an asset manager, whatever, um, if you are launching something like a tokenized money market fund, the clawback feature has to be there. It's mandated by uh, regulations and by regulators. So that's what provided them access to the seller network. That's why they chose the seller network to tokenize on. The same goes for the XRP ledger. I think that with the DID, the AMM, even the ZKP, all of these amendments, all of these features that are now coming to the XRP ledger, it's all going to be it's all going to be crucial for these institutions to tap in. And like I said, that's why I personally look at what Ripple is trying to do, how they're forging a path towards institutional DeFi on the XRP ledger, and why we're now starting to see the stablecoin initiatives, we're starting to see the integrations with Axler and Zonix, like these are big moves and it's really showing the hand that ripple has right now and the hand that they're playing and it's actually very beneficial to the ledger to xrp and even xrp holders most people are not seeing this because again they're clouded by the price action and that's totally okay but for me personally i'm really looking at this as a major step in the right direction around xrp around ripple and the ultimate goal of the internet of value so with that being said i hope that you guys enjoyed this video if you guys did definitely leave a like subscribe some notifications on because more free content you guys are more than welcome to follow me on twitter and join the free discord in the description below and with that being said guys it's been nick thanks for watching peace out